So I think we're going to get underway, and so I'm just going to uh, say a few words of welcome, very much in the, in the style of the school, the, the students will arrive like a kind of quiet river. Um, but the spirit of this event anyway was a little bit of a, more of a sort of semi-private idea. This is, the, just to let those of you who are um, visiting us this afternoon, the spirit of, this, of, of today is that of a workshop for a group of scholars uh, here at the school to work with our colleagues from, from Pamplona to think through the question of what it means the architect's journey from, let's say, a more kind of philosophical point of view to sort of get, get ourselves used to this very, very big uh, uh, question as part of the preparation for, for a huge event on the question of the architect's journey that the School of Architecture in Pamplona is going to hold in May. And by the way, um, we'll remind you of this towards the end of the day, but in theory, it's not too late to, uh, technically it's too late to submit your abstracts to be part of that conference, but if you get very excited by the question, I think if you send a terrific abstract in, you may find yourself going to Pamplona, which means, by the way, going to the world's best food. So, um, were you to write a very good abstract on the question of travel, you would get to travel, and in true tourist fashion, you'd get to eat extremely well. And while eating very well, your mind would open up and something would happen. And I think this conference is very much about the possibility that the architect's mind somehow opens up or comes into existence in the moment of travel, assuming for a moment there is such a thing as the architect's mind. Or at least maybe it, it is the thought that it's in traveling that one could raise the question, is there a mind of the architect uh, uh, or not? So in that sense, what we're gonna do is today uh, um, enjoy a kind of um, sort of intimate workshop between scholars trying to understand the dimension of the question that's going to be explored later. And this afternoon's workshop has been uh, organized by uh, Galia Solomonoff, and so she's going to introduce to you to the event. But I just want to again express my, um, my sort of fr uh, friendship and, and the pleasure with which it is for us uh, to collaborate with the University of Pamplona. A number of members of the faculty of this school and of Princeton and, and of the Architectural Association and, and kind of sort of uh, heavy duty schools around the world uh, spend quite a lot of their time uh, teaching workshops in Pamplona because Pamplona has a unique institution by which leading scholars from around the world are invited to give very, very intense classes to the students. And I can guarantee you that for those teachers, myself being one of them, there is a great intensity to that teaching and a great thirst coming from the students but also the, the, the intensity and the thirst and the being in a different place allows for another kind of thinking to take place. So I think there are a number of scholars around the world who probably appreciate as much as the school appreciates this possibility to be in Pamplona. So it's a kind of very, very kind of late but genuine sense of, uh, uh, of friendship and hospitality to finally, just for one moment, to invite you to come uh, uh, in the other direction. I make no promises about the food. Um, Although any crime we commit in the food area will only make your return to Pamplona all the more uh, uh, exciting. And at least it offers you the opportunity to be visitors in Pamplona. Uh, and if this con conference is based somehow around the idea that when you go somewhere else, um, something happens, I think it can be great to generate an invitation to become a visitor in your own home. So hopefully you go back to Pamplona with some new kind of curiosities and, and, and new efforts. But anyway, just to hand over now to, to Galia, whose afternoon it is, and we're in her um, extremely sophisticated hands. Galia. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, thank you, Dean Wigley. Uh, it used to be a simple task to do an introduction. It's no longer a simple task because uh, Dean Wigley has elevated the task of introduction to a different, a different level. Those 10 minutes are now charged with a, a, a different mission. Um, and so today I'm introducing uh, the topic from my own perspective. Um, uh, what I, I feel that uh, we're going to talk about many different trips. Uh, and trips of and journeys of uh, personal and global and multicultural nature. Um, the the two trips or the two journeys that I will briefly touch on um, are um, the immigrant journey and the 
trip as the kind of delirious trip. Um, and I also want to uh, thank uh, for this afternoon uh, Beatriz Colomina, whose uh, topic uh, in many ways this is, and to uh, whom I feel has uh, brought the idea of the personal side of the architect as being much more meaningful than it used to be, uh, in the sense that uh, the way um, I see the heroes of architecture, uh, Corbusier or Mies, um, have totally been changed by the way uh, Beatrice talked about them, by Mies Not and by, which I saw in this room many years ago, uh, um, a, an incredible lecture that kind of demystify uh, Mies as this kind of um, uh, man with a chisel. Um, and, and also uh, the view of uh, Le Corbusier as this unpolite gentleman who kind of uh, uh, visited um, a house and painted in a world that was not his. Um, so uh, so this, this room um, has a tremendous, um, it, it, it's kind of a home. Uh, of a different kind, and uh, it's part of the journey. Um, I was, so uh, the, the, the feeling that I have is that we are all foreign. Uh, we are all foreign uh, in this room, in this lecture, and we are all immigrants, and immigrants as being this uh, category that um, in the strict political sense, it's, it's coincidental with the uh, initiation of nations and, and, and states, but in terms of uh, philosophical ways, it's not that different. Um, the difference between a Roman citizen and a Roman slave, it's not that different from the, dif from the, um, the national and the kind of uh, illegal in either Europe or the United States. Um, so we are all immigrants in this room. Uh, we are all immigrants or foreigners in this panel. And we are going to be talking about immigrants and foreigners. We're going to be talking about Le Corbusier. We're going to be talking uh, about uh, Rudofsky. Um, and when I think about Le Corbusier, I think about uh, um, uh, Picasso. I always do. For me, they are like, uh, uh, because of my upbringing in art and architecture, it's impossible for me to separate one from the other in terms of the impetus and the understanding of modernism and the break. And when I think about Picasso, I think about Spain, and I think what would have been the world if Franco uh, was not this ruthless person that made these amazing people go from Spain to Paris. And so Paris of the 30s without Franco um, would have been totally different, as would be New York of the 70s without all the upheaval of Latin America, um, which um, uh, I, I had a teacher in elementary school, Olga Baroni, and she used to, she's 80 now, and she used to say, uh, if it was not for Mussolini, I would be a very quiet peasant outside Florence. And instead, I am a feminist and an educator. And so the, the sense of, so lucky we, lucky we that suffer the wars and the juntas and the famines and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and um, we got to survive and to explore a world beyond of what, the one that was given. And we give ourselves a birth, a very painful birth, nevertheless a birth that would you would not give up for a moment. Um, the beginning of my trip uh, was, whoa. The beginning of my trip was New York. Hmm. Uh, uh, inflation had reached 2,000% in Argentina. So 
uh, please, when you talk about recession, put it in perspective for me. Uh, I had, I, there was a 45-day strike in, in uh, Rosario, Argentina, and the university that I went to. And so coming from uh, Rosario to New York was a no-brainer. Um, basically, well, 2,000% inflation. Just, just think about what you have in your pocket. And if you come out of here in half an hour, what would be if, if that was the case? Um, uh, no. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so in the, the beginning of my trip was New York in the 80s. Inflation had reached 2,000%. After a 45-day a strike, I decided to come here in New York with the uh, MKs, the Mad Club, CB Shivis, was my home. And I discovered uh, the nightclub life of the 80s, and I discovered the tripping uh, culture. And, uh, and the, the, uh, the artists of the moment, um, many of them, uh, uh, became um, kind of a new community and a new home. And I, I came to Colombia, and one of the books of the time was uh, The Concept of Dwelling by Christian Norbert Schulz. And in there, uh, there was a description of Heidegger of dwelling as concern, care, uh, and the expectation of the house of being as a a kind of a way of relating what was totally unfamiliar or difficult as a concept of being to something that was totally familiar as the idea of a house. Um, and the idea of, of genius logi and the relationship to a ground and that living and dwelling was the same as being in a way. And the idea of the earth and the sky and the divine and the mortal and uh, and so the, the continuation of the idea of the quest for home, as uh, of homeland, or the space of uh, being safe, uh, as a kind of a natural um, territory of research for the, for the architect. The displays being almost the perfect architect because it's totally invested in the uh, understanding of uh, home and uh, locale. And, and so like, like, like that, it uh, became clear to me that uh, people like Le Corbusier, people like Gropius, people like Mies uh, would be um, our uh, perfect subjects, unbearably neurotic, imperfect beings, immigrants, yet beloved architects. So with that, that's my understanding of the subject today, but we're going to hear uh, from the first person we're going to hear from today, it's from Felicity Scott, who is the director of the program in critical, curatorial, and conceptual practices here at, at the GSAP at Columbia University, and a founder, co-editor of Grey Room, uh, a quarterly journal of architecture, art, media, and politics published by MIT Press since 2000, along with numerous articles, catalog, essays, and reviews. She's the author of Architecture or Techno-Utopia, Politics After Modernism, MIT Press 2007, and Living Archive 7, and Farm, Arm Farm, Actar 2008. Felicity, thank you. Thank you, Galia. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak here and, uh, and also to find an occasion to revisit um, uh, some of my research on Bernard Rudofsky that I've not um, uh, been thinking about for a number of years and to put that in a very different context, which uh, I hope makes sense here. So how do we move this forward? Yeah. So, what I want to offer today are some thoughts on the itinerancy of the Austrian um, emigre architect, Bernard Rudolsky. 
particularly as his experience of social and territorial insecurity impacted his distinctly modern conception of dwelling as itself a type of journey. So to do this, I'm going to focus on his architectural work in Italy during the mid-1930s, as well as uh, on a couple of texts that he published uh, in Domus in 1938, immediately before uh, his departure to Latin America. And although I want to stage this presentation biographically, I, I want to posit right from the start that what remains interesting about Radovsky's biography, and certainly uh, his travel itineraries, is the degree to which they reveal the contours of a transforming modernity, at once in the technological and architectural realms, and on account of geopolitical pressures of the early 20th century. And indeed, I, I think I want to posit that we find um, Radovsky experiencing the, the historical consequences uh, of these transformations in an intensely personal manner. And I think one could trace this not only in the period in Italy, but also in the United States during the 40s and beyond, uh, and also certainly during his period in Japan in the late 1950s. And I also want to mark uh, right at the outset my intended departure from the reception of Radovsky as a heroic adventurer and humanist or humane designer, uh, or as an enlightened champion um, of less developed, we might say, or non-Western culture, uh, as manifest recently in the exhibition uh, and catalog, Lessons from Bernard Rudofsky, Life as a Voyage, uh, and certainly also in earlier claims as to the so-called ethical function of his appeal to pre-modern or sort of authentic vernacular architecture. And so just to say that I don't find it uh, particularly interesting to try and add Rudofsky to a list of, of overlooked or under-recognized modern architects. And he certainly doesn't qualify for the category of an architectural avant-garde or as any type of political radical. But what we do find repeatedly in his work and what I want to look at here are uh, sort of highly symptomatic and, and often quite prescient responses to emergent forces knocking at the door of architectural modernism. Uh, responses that I think offer us a framework, uh, a framework to read and understand the discipline's relation to, uh, and certainly its implications within uh, geopolitical transformations, as well as those in the social and technological milieu. And Rudovsky's condition and also of operating somewhat on the margins, we might say, or sort of in the shadows of the main stage of architectural modernism, while remaining remarkably connected to it, and exactly, um, uh, I think this uh, uh, nexus is important, might certainly have informed the capacity of his work to be read uh, symptomatically, as I'm going to propose. But to come back to the topic of today's symposium, I think that we also need to pay attention to the specifics of Rudovsky's life as a perpetual journey, uh, in this case, his journey to the Mediterranean uh, during the 1930s. This is Casa Oro from the mid-1930s. So in October 1937, Rudofsky moved to Milan in order to take up an invitation by Gioponti to join the editorial team at Domus and also to pursue collaborative design work. Rudofsky had been living in the small town of Positano on the Amalfi Coast since May of that year. And even beyond the lure of such unprecedented professional opportunities that he would relocate so soon after uh, having settled in a new place was hardly atypical. In fact, for Radovsky, it had become almost habitual. After leaving Vienna in March of 1932, initially for the island of Capri, Radovsky had moved to Naples late the following year and in turn to the island of Procida in March 1934. In late September 1935, he left Italy for the United States, spending a month in Paris en route to New York, where he arrived in early November. He would then return to Naples the following July at the uh, request of Luigi Cosenza in order to complete work on this building, the Casa Oro, a remarkable modernist villa in Posillipo, which is a headlands on the outskirts of Naples, which they had designed together in 1935 and which was nearing completion when Radovsky left for Milan to work with Domus. And this was not the first or certainly the last work Radovsky undertook with Cosenza, or even the first to be published, nor was it the first design for a Mediterranean house. And even if, as we shall see, rather atypical in its integrated relation to its site, Casa Oro would launch Radovsky into a newfound prominence as a modern designer, enjoying significant critical reception as a Casa El Mare. And even before the construction had begun, 
Giuseppe Pagano had presented the project in some detail in the April 1936 issue of Casabella, publishing plans and elevations, site photographs, uh, and some of these remarkable panoramic photographs uh, of a model, and the model had actually been commissioned um, uh, from the Amon brothers in Vienna. Uh, the context of, of Pagano's presentation was a dossier on the work of Cosenza, championed as a new active Neapolitan force, and as demonstrating a new conscious architectonic will, one that resolved aesthetic and constructive problems beyond the rubric, rubric of formal academic exercises. Situating the work precisely at the then polemical nexus of rationalism and the Mediterraneanism, Pagano spoke of it as offering tests of a brave modernity, uh, demonstrations of a geometric serenity or a cubist abstraction, and hence incipient modernity and rationalist temperament of the vernacular architecture of the Neapolitan region and its islands. And in a remark that brings us to another increasingly troubled question in Italian architecture, he went on to refer to their collaboration as a symptom of the times, suggesting that it manifest a meeting of analogous spirits in which Rodofsky's northern approach had been captivated by the living elements of the earth, the sun, and which had materialized formal and programmatic research into local architectural elements. Ponty too would write on the house immediately after its completion in December 1937 in Domus. He suggested that it might be our most beautiful villa, referring to its exceptional status uh, within the Neapolitan context on account of the purity of its architectural values. With respect to its location, Ponti went on to assert, this might be the site of profound architectural knowledge since forms of habitation unchanged for 2,000 years can be studied right here on the Bay of Naples, forms which he continued to a large extent represent the foundations of architectural aesthetics. And so here he also proposed was a manifestation of architectural fervor, a fervor implicitly cast into distinction to the more conservative or neoclassical Roman uh, tendencies, as well as from the more uh, purely international forms of the North. And so here I'm just trying to situate Rodofsky right at the center of Italian debates. In January 1940, a few months after the outbreak of World War II, Casa Oro was featured on the cover of the Architectural Review. Framed by a large cactus plant and nestled into its rocky perch, the stark white villa was shown facing out onto the Bay of Naples with Mount Vesuvius beyond. It appeared within the issue alongside the work of Franco Albini and other Italian-born architects in a section entitled some recent Italian buildings, an innocuous title betraying little of what was at stake in the editor's con uh, ominous remarks um, that depicted here were a series of works which might represent modern Italian architecture in its last international phase. If not quite historically accurate, and so it actually sort of miscasts the history of Italian rationalism uh, and of Mussolini's embrace uh, of modernist aesthetics, but the editorial introduction alluded to the uh, political stakes then facing modernism in Italy. These were being played out, he suggested, along an axis of rationalism versus neoclassicism for which the international exhibition to be held in Rome in 1942 would mark the apotheosis of what they called conflicting forces that hang in the balance. Italian architecture is at crossroads, the editor announced. For according, uh, for according to the spirit in which it is developed, a nationalist influence may lead either forward or back. So E42, or, or later called EUR, would indeed uh, be a landmark event in this troubled history of modern architecture's relation to fascism. But it did not, of course, we might say, solve the uh, question of whether Italian architecture would be progressive or not on account of this relation to nationalism. Uh, and Rodofsky took these photographs during his first trip back to Europe in 1948. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was a trip. Um, uh, it was also his first uh, cross-Atlantic plane flight. And he um, recounts in his diary this peculiar sensation that having arrived in Paris, uh, that East 57th Street might be just around the corner. And he talks about the, uh, the incomprehensibility uh, of the shortness of the flight. So Casa Oro, as you see here, seemed almost to grow out of its rugged and dramatic hilltop perch, the low, narrow site itself appearing almost as an interruption in the surrounding stone ramparts. 
This three-story reinforced concrete structure emerges from a rocky foundation and volcanic stone plinth with stark white volume staggered along the hillside to produce multiple stone terraces as the structure followed the contour of the road behind and stepped back on its stony platform. It's definitively sighted or grounded in its location while articulated with a type of dialectical modernist rigor. And if evidently harboring the language of international modernism in its formal and material treatment, you know, with the white walls, uh, the steel hand railings, the absence of cornices, etc., the design also spoke of the stark whitewashed walls, accumulative ordering, uh, ordering simple geometric volumes, uh, and the stepped terracing characteristic of Mediterranean hill towns. Yeah, these were its intended references. The architectural review also stated the connection of this modern villa to artisanal production, noting the work was carried out by the labor of local fishermen and peasants. Indeed, Casa Oro seemed to many to embody the very nexus of Mediterraneanism, of modernism, and the myth of the Mediterranean in a very real sense. But it was not, however, solely in terms of its reception within architectural debates that we find the history of Casa Oro all too proximate to the history of fascism. Indeed, when Pagano presented it in Casabella alongside three other projects, its construction had been delayed on account of the League of Nations sanctions imposed on Italy following the country's colonial invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. Yeah, Italy had invaded Ethiopia without a declaration of war on October 3, and on May 7, 1936, annexed the formerly sovereign African state, in turn merging the territory with Eritrea and Italian Somaliland to declare a new state on June 1, Africa Orientale Italiana. In addition to Casa Oro, Pagano's 1936 account included this, the competition entry for the Palazzo del Littorio in Rome of 1934, uh, and the distinctly monumental and actually prize-winning entry for the Rome Auditorium of the same year, as well as a more rationalist design for a tennis club in Naples of 1935. The Palazzo di Littorio competition, to come back, had been the first collaboration between Cosenzi, uh, Cosenza and Rodofsky, and in participating, Rodofsky found himself effectively at the center of debates regarding architecture's role in serving the fascist regime and its imperial ambitions. With the proposed, actually I'll leave it there, with the proposed location adjacent to the ruins of the ancient imperial forum, the Colosseum, and other key symbols of Italy's imperial past, the Palazzo program was to provide headquarters for the National Fascist Party, or PNF. It included offices, assembly halls, and rallying areas, along with housing the famous and highly popular exhibition of the fascist revolution, replete with a sanctuary for fascist martyrs. Beyond the controversies surrounding the site, which involved the demolition of existing buildings and laid bare the imperial hubris of the PNF, the competition served as a fulcrum in the struggle to define a building style appropriate for Mussolini's regime, catalyzing a long-standing battle between the rationalist lineage of fascist modernism and the more traditional Stile del Toro and its appropriation of figurative elements. Radovsky and Cosenza's suitably monumental entry uh, entered under Cosenza's name, for entrance had to be Italian and members of the fascist party, with its rhythmic colonnade, which you can't really see here, uh, stood somewhat closer to the rationalist side of this equation, or at least uh, posited something of a compromise. Importantly here for our story, Radovsky would use the prize money uh, from the auditorium competition to embark on another journey. With anxieties mounting, earlier mounting, over Mussolini's imperial goals in Ethiopia, and the initial failure of the League of Nations to respond effectively to the Abyssinian crisis and the buildup of Italian troops, he left Italy in late September of 1935, as I mentioned before, to travel to Paris and on to the United States. By the time he arrived in New York on November 3, the second Italo-Abyssinian War was well underway. And it was when the League of Nations dropped the sanctions against Italy in July 36 that Radovsky returned to start work on building Casa Oro. Radovsky wrote about preparing for his first journey to the US a number of years later. In the fall of 35, so his story goes, the impossible had happened. The impending war in Ethiopia had rendered his Italian paradise oppressive, so his words. So as he recalled, on the very day I received the good news of winning 30,000 lira for the auditorium competition, I decided to spend a year in the United States and arranged to leave within a fortnight. 
He discovered, however, that as a foreigner, he could not deposit money in an Italian bank and that lira could not be exported. His newfound wealth, as he put it, and I quote, both filled him with anguish, anguish and left him with an unattractive bulge in his trousers. Rodowski spent the next 10 days catching a small boat from Procida, where he resided, to Naples, unsuccessfully trying to sell the lira. Thwarted, wealthy, more nervous than ever, I returned at day's end to my island, he recalled, with his ears ringing from the investment advice of friends, buy gold, diamonds, what about neckties, he eventually moved to a hotel in Naples two days before his departure for America, wherein he had an epiphany and set out to purchase three portable objects which seemed appropriate to travel to America, a watch, a camera, and a typewriter. A watch, he noted, uh, was far from needed in the mental climate of southern Italy, but in America it was not evident that clock towers would strike on the hour and time was money. Having purchased the most expensive watch in the shop, a Patek Philippe for 2,000 lira, and he talked about having examined only the leather, uh, the leather band, which is what he could judge, he set off to buy a camera. I allotted myself all of 10 minutes for my purchase, he recalled. While he had once been given an old-fashioned accordion-type Zeiss, it had simply vanished one day, and he had not regretted the loss. I was not particularly fond of taking pictures, he explained, but the prospect of seeing a new country made me wish to own a camera again. In the midst of shopping at the Galleria, he found himself conscious of time. I glanced furtively at my watch, he recounted. It was the first time I consulted it, and I had anticipated this moment as something pleasurable. Instead, I realized with a growing vexation that I was fighting not only against money, so to say, but also against time. With the mechanization of time assured by his watch and that of vision by his new Leica, Rodowski had one more activity to mechanize, mechanize, and he headed straight for the Naples branch of the Olivetti, Olivetti typewriting company, noting that he'd previously only been interested in its showroom design. The transaction began easily. Mindful of the conservative United States, whither I was soon to depart, he recounted, I had chosen a featherweight black portable model. In order to avoid any time-consuming complications, I was perfectly willing to pay less than the market price. Would you like to try the touch, the man asked, while inserting a sheet of paper. No, thank you, Rodofsky responded, noting that he'd never used a typewriter. He then recalled that at this point in the purchase, a certain haziness had started to overcome him, a sensation that was, as he put it, quite different to being tired. In the back of my mind, I sensed that I had come to the end of a chapter in the course of my life. With a timepiece strapped to my body, life would never again be the same. I was no longer a free man. I would have to insure my watch and my typewriter. Suddenly, it came to me that I was buying insecurity. During the final phases of the sale, the branch manager, a brief acquaintance, had returned. Realizing that Rodofsky was going abroad and having the right connections, he organized the exchange of the remaining lira, thereby providing at least temporary relief. Thus, Rodofsky concluded his tale. When it was over, I felt like coming out of anesthesia. Normalcy rushed in almost audibly. Before long, I stopped, I stopped touching my deflated hip pocket. I walked lightly, the soft bounce uh, of a post-convalescent. Neapolitans spilled from the fragrant alleys into the broad seaside promenade. My curiosity, for which an entire waking day had been riveted to consumer goods, shifted back to people. And so, as suggested uh, by this story, um, uh, this sort of episode was experienced quite literally as a withdrawal from his previous milieu into a world mediated by money and modern technology. Equipped with a watch, a camera, and a typewriter, Rodofsky's time, his vision, and his writing could all now operate within modern technical domains, and they'd be impacted by the fragmentation, organizational patterns, and mechanical qualities of these new tools. But I also want then to come back to the other side of Rodofsky's uh, work in Italy, uh, and even uh, to his collaboration with Cosenza. In 1937, Domus published this remarkable Villa Campanella of 1936, another project designed for rocky outcrop, this time east of Positano along the Amalfi Coast, but cast in very distinct terms. It was presented as a shelter for travelers, or even, as the title of the article suggests, referring to the ancient kingdom of Western Anatolia, now Turkey, as a dwelling for all Lydians, and it reduced the domestic space to a simple refuge with largely open spaces. 
As Cazenza noted in a fictional dialogue with his client, you don't need a house. Rudofsky's brief period of collaboration with Gioponti between late 37 and March 38 produced three related proposals for sheltering travelers, offering them minimal refuge-like accommodations within larger settlements and a means of escaping the pressures of urban life through simulating vernacular environments in southern Italy. These included what you see here, the Albergo Apositano, uh, there's also a, oh, sorry, we saw before, a hotel um, for Dalmatia, and this, the Albergo di San Michel of 1938 in Anacapri on a site near Axel Munter's Villa San Michel. The latter sought to capture something of the island's noted architectural vernaculars, and hence, as Ponti later suggested, the many pleasures of its pre-industrial uh, way of life for temporary visitors. So Capri, as mentioned earlier, had been the place to which Rodowski had headed following his departure from Austria. Several years earlier, it had, or many years earlier, it had captured the imagination of fellow Austrian traveler, Josef Hoffmann, who in 1897 published an illustrated account of his encounter with the island's remarkable environment, a publication which sponsored a long-standing northern romance, certainly among the Austrian, with the Mediterranean. By the time Rudofsky uh, arrived, it had become a key destination, not only for architects, but for artists, intellectuals, and other travelers, seeking an alternative to the pressures of metropolitan life. Under the auspices of Edwin Cerio, who in 1922 had convened a famous landscape, a symposium on landscape, the island had become, moreover, an important flashpoint in debates and legislation for preservation of the vernacular environment in the island's panoramic beauty. Moreover, Capri was the subject of Rudofsky's first publication on the question of Mediterranean vernaculars, this Capricitia and a Capricitia, uh, which appeared in 1934. And here, far from romanticizing an authentic or harmonious Mediterranean environment, and certainly in contrast to nationalist claims, Rudofsky offered three quite peculiar vignettes. Citing Cerio, the first vignette detailed a type of architectural warfare a contestation or even a dispetto architecture played out in the building wall, building's walls to deprive the neighbors of sunshine. Rodowski referred to these constructions as monuments of human malice. Accompanied by his own photographs, the second vignette told the story of the construction of Casa di Tragara, it was actually Axel Munter's uh, villa, cast here as a private labyrinth that had evolved without the mediation of architectural representation, yet somehow resonated with the work of Gaudí, Rudolf Steiner, and Adolf Loos. Noting that its owner had not heard of Loos's writings against ornament, Rudolfsky wrote, it's surprising that many of the things which were self-evident to him were the cause of violent feuds or quarrels among the race of architects, which have still not ended. And he would later revisit this villa, uh, celebrating it as a type of architecture without architects and as having walls uh, that didn't speak. Third was a photo collage depicting a courtyard house that Rodofsky had designed for himself, entitled House B in Capri, preliminary sketch. The caption tells us that the design had taken as its prototype a Pompeian dwelling that paradoxically no longer existed at its point of origin in the Gulf of Naples, and that he had recuperated or appropriated this inner courtyard typology, even returned it to its mountainous region. And this photograph, somewhat paradoxically, is actually of, of his uh, villa um, collaged into Santorin, not actually into Capri. Rudofsky would further I uh, develop ideas for courtyard houses in his 1935 proposal for a house for Berta Doctor, soon to be Berta Rudofsky, on the island of Procida. This was published in Casabella in 1936, and, uh, sorry, 37, and appeared in Domus in March 1938 under the title, What We Need Is Not a New Technology, But a New Way of Living, one of a series of reflections which Rudofsky contributed during his brief, like, two-month period as an editor. His presentation of the Prachida House opened with a panoramic drawing, uh, panoramic drawing of the house situated at the center of a mythologically saturated Mediterranean universe. This was a country house for an unprejudiced woman, he explained, a woman who went barefoot and draped herself in uncut fabric. The text began with a series of formulations of how the sole of the foot had lost touch with the surface of the house. And throughout the article, Rodofsky focused on techniques of bringing the subject down to the floor. He described tables and beds without legs and espoused the benefits of assuming a reclining position to dine, proposing that upholstered fabrics could cover entire floors of bedrooms in lieu of a traditionally raised bed. 
Preempting a trope found in his later exhibition, Our Clothes Modern, Ardovsky even queried whether a man might be found whose foot retained its original fanned state, you know, like this, a foot that had not yet been molded into a point. The house, as you see, uh, as you saw, was designed around a central outdoor courtyard. The kitchen, he noted, was electric, and here recalling Polini and Fagini's Casa Electrica from the Monza exhibition, and the bathroom was fully equipped. Intimacy with his architecture would be assisted by the thinness of the soles of his sandals, the looseness of clothing. Rudowski's eclectic reflections in Domus appeared in appear in retrospect as highly symptomatic. They typically roll, uh, revolved around this nexus of Mediterranean forms of life, domesticity, flaws, the human body, particularly the foot, clothing and fashion, fabrics, climate, technology, militarism, and territory. They often took this sort of semi-fictional or mythological character, offering somewhat irreverent accounts of the prehistoric or, uh, origins or imaginary futures of modern dwelling from caves to trailers. The final and to my mind most remarkable text appeared one month later, entitled End of the City, or in the German manuscript, actually End of the European City. It marks one of the few occasions that Rodowski spoke directly to the increasing militarization of the environment and to the geopolitical legacy of war. The text is comprised of a rather ambiguous set of reflections juxtaposing the future of nomadic dwelling in Europe and the US. Such a condition would emerge as an anachronism in Europe, he speculated, where in cave dwelling and a return to the former nomadism of the Euro-Asian steppes, of which Eastern European gypsies were the last survivors, would be the product of weaponry born of World War I and perhaps yet another imminent wartime tragedy. In the United States, he suggested, by contrast, without the experience of such a tragedy on their soil and with government encouragement, there were signs of what he called a new migration of the masses, born of a free condition and a population that tends to nomadism. And here he's juxtaposing it, of course, with the treatment of the European gypsies and the attempt uh, to uh, uh, confine them within the um, uh, uh, geopolitics of the nation state. Hundreds of millions of families, he remarked with some exaggeration, have abandoned land and house to create for themselves new conditions of existence as a permanent voyage. The first page of the article, and I'm sorry I'm missing the images here, uh, presented a photograph taken by Pagano of an excavation of ruins of ancient houses in Potenza in Italy that, as Rodowski noted, had contemporary vernacular counterparts. His commentary, however, was not indicating their ongoing viability on account of the prospect of total war and the impending threat of the raising of cities, architects, he argued, um, were currently unable to imagine the future of any European architecture. Moreover, with the introduction of two new types of aggressive arms, the air force and asphyxiating gas, and given the impossibility of defense keeping pace with the development of military technologies, the city, he posited, might well have come to the end of its viable development. The new generations, he concluded, could have to choose between the habitable cave and the mobile house. Facing Pagano's photograph of ruins, and again, I don't have it, was an image of what he called a new mobile habitation, one mass produced like other American industrial commodities, and it's a, a trailer on wheels, uh, a caravan trailer on wheels. Illustrated alongside a Lancia a car, the prefabricated house was, as the caption suggested, an important problem for sociologists and economists. Although, as he suggested, the technical dimensions of the mobile home had not yet arrived in Europe, the incentive was nevertheless in place. Confronted with the threat of the destruction of the European city, sedentary man, too, would take on a way of living in what he called continuous movement. So as with Casa Oro, Rudowski's end of the city appears, in retrospect, to be haunted by the intense violence of Mussolini's imperial actions. Il Duce notoriously authorized the use of mustard gas, yes, asphyxiating gases, and other chemical weapons. His actions provoked mass migrations, and he established, of course, forced labor camps in North Africa. In his telegram to the League of Nations, Ethiopian Emperor Hale Selassie had forewarned of what might come to pass should Europe continue to stand by during such annexations. We now demand that the League of Nations, and I'm quoting, we now demand that the League of Nations should continue its efforts to secure respect for the covenant and that it should decide not to recognize territorial extensions or the exercise of an assumed sovereignty resulting from the illegal recourse to armed force and to numerous other violations of international agreements. It is us today, he warned, it will be you 
tomorrow. So the timing for Adovsky's newfound success in Milan would prove inauspicious in precisely such terms. Before his final text had even appeared in Domus, Rodovsky had been compelled to move on again. Following Adolf Hitler's announcement of the Anschluss, or annexation of Austria, on March 12, 1938, he fled Geneva with his wife Bertha, and they sailed from Trieste, actually, and Trieste was once an important part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, prior to its collapse at the end of World War I, uh, and subsequently itself annexed by Italy. Anyway, they fled to Latin America, spending six weeks in Buenos Aires before moving to Rio de Janeiro, and in turn, that December, to Sao Paulo. Initially working as a furniture designer, for a branch of Galeria Heuberger, he quickly found independent work as a modern architect in Brazil. In 1939, he built an extension to a traditional farmhouse for a French emigre, and in the same year, he produced this, the spectacular Kosher Watch Shop, uh, also in Sao Paulo. The following year, he built uh, houses for Jao Anstein and Virgilio Frontini, uh, as well as a camera shop, the Photoptica, also in Sao Paulo. While the Photoptica is unpublished and no drawings remain, these two patio houses were widely published and became known to the American public through the 1943 MoMA circulating exhibition, Brazil Builds. Rodofsky would in fact remain in Sao Paulo until April 1941, when he arrived passportless in New York as the Latin American prize winner of the Museum of Modern Arts Organic Design uh, in Home Furnishings competition, just in time uh, to be rendered an enemy alien as the US entered the war. In this, in this sense, it also seems in retrospect all too overdetermined that Radovsky's first publication in America was the report of a Beaux-Arts Institution design jury on evacuation camps. And we can say also that both organic design and, and later Brazil builds form part of MoMA's wartime Pan-American program, you know, sort of responding to US anxieties of, uh, of regarding potential Latin American sympathies uh, for German, Italian, and Spanish fascism. Uh, the US government participated in this sort of goodwill policy uh, towards Latin America, largely as a form of defense. So this legacy of violence would also continue to haunt his work. When Radovsky first returned to Europe in 1948, and in his new capacity as an architectural editor at Interiors, not only did he visit Mussolini's Third Rome, but he worked on a dossier of post-war Italian furniture. In the context of this 50-page publication, he included a commentary by his friend, the architect, designer, and of course editor, Ernesto Rogers, who explained, and I quote, those who have seen whole cities destroyed, who for years have been forced to postpone their own lives, who have moved about from place to place in freight cars, or who have lived in hiding, do not seem able to settle down again. Their work is marked by the experience they have lived through. Just look at this furniture. Folding chairs, folding tables, folding beds, armchairs on wheels, cabinets with movable shelves, bookcases to be assembled and demounted. There's even a small flower table that looks as though it had been planned for an emergency, a portable something answering an unavoidable necessity. It's a world forced to escape from itself by constant movement. Are we confronted then with an architectural expression of existentialism? End of quote. Also introducing the collection, George Nelson alluded to this quality of imminent departure. As a reflection of the unsettled years, he wrote, many of the rooms look as if their occupants had temporarily paused in flight. So what I want to propose here then is that if one takes the distinct strangeness of Radovsky's early text seriously, then his work becomes legible as a response to this troubled moment. That is to say, Radovsky's peculiar obsessions, such as returning the body to an intimacy with the floor, the idea of an unfettered foot, and his fascination with caves and mobile architecture, are perhaps better read not as aberrations to be passed over while reviewing his pursuit of an authentic, ethical, or even humane form of modern architecture derived from the Mediterranean and other vernaculars, but rather as symptomatic responses to his experience of the deterritorializing forces of modernity as they intersected with architectural debates. Rodofsky's work and thinking were very much imbricated within, if not entirely assimilated to, the polemical and shifting contours that we've seen of Italian debates of rationalism, traditionalism, Mediterraneanism, Europeanism, and internationalism, for which Domus and Casabella were quite central. Let's skip over this. So for, a, for on the eve of the Second World War, and as witness to a period of rising nationalism and imperialism in Italy, we find our key protagonist formulating architectural typologies and modes of dwelling 
that despite their origin in his reflections on the Mediterranean, would come to internalize his condition of uprootedness to produce a distinctly non-regional, post-national figuration of dwelling. Rodofsky's lifelong iteration of the courtyard typology and his repeated claims to the intimacy it facilitated emerged, that is, as another response to the uprooted condition of modern subjects. In this, in this if this response can be understood to have affiliations with a retreat to the interior, characteristic of Jugendstil, it's notably distinct from that of many other architects, such as, we might say, the reactionary preservation of the homeland, characteristic of Schultz and Naumburg, the return to regionalism in Lewis Mumford and others, the functionalist provision of mass housing in Hannes Meyer and others, or even the utopian embrace of such a disinterment, and we think there perhaps of Buckminster Fuller. Rudolfsky's experience of deracination was not simply a sense of homelessness or even homesickness prompted by his departure from Austria, whether initially to work in Berlin in the late 1920s or during his self-imposed emigration to Italy in 1932. Nor was it exacerbated in his subsequent trajectory from Italy to South America and then to the US. In fact, the US would figure ultimately as the most adequate home, as evident in his repeated discussions of a disidentification with nations and a type of cosmopolitanism that the US facilitated. Rather, Radovsky's loss of a homeland, I want to argue here, arose slightly earlier in 1918 with the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He never identified with Austria as a nation following the reconstruction of political borders in Central and Eastern Europe after World War I. Indeed, he often explained to American audiences that he was born in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, noting that it had almost half as many inhabitants as the US, 13 official languages, and that the linguistic variety was matched by the cultural ones. As with Sigmund Freud and Adolf Loos, Radovsky had in fact been born in Moravia, but was raised in Vienna. And like Freud, it seems that he experienced the division of the geopolitical territory of his youth as a traumatic violation of a powerful edifice. Freud himself noted on November 11, 1918, Austria-Hungary is no more. I do not want to live anywhere else. For me, emigration is out of the question. I shall live on with the torso, imagining that it is whole. And we might recall that in Freud's 1927 account of fetishism, the subject in disavowing the site of the absence of the female phallus, constructed a memorial in its place through the action of the act of substituting a proximate object. The fetish was a perverse construction erected over that gap. Producing a reconciliation of two irreconcilable realities, the fetish, as Freud explained, with respect to this absent object, was designed to preserve it from extinction. And in turn, he connected the fetish with territory noting that a grown man may perhaps experience a similar panic when the cry goes up that throne and altar are in danger and similarly illogical consequences will ensure. So to conclude, Rudofsky's response to the loss of his homeland took the form of a repeated and lifelong displacement of an intensive cathexis onto the modern house. An attempted reconciliation, we might say, again to invoke Freud's terms, of two irreconcilable realities. A product of historical trauma, it gave rise to a form of fetishism operating simultaneously in the domains of territory and domesticity, the latter being evident in his desire to produce an intimate and quite fetishistic connection to the house and its equipment. Rudofsky's response then to the experience of life as a perpetual journey was thus the articulation of a new cartography of dwelling, a provocative, if somewhat defensive, reaction to a condition of uprooting without end that might provisionally be characterized in terms of a shift from the experience of not being at home anywhere to something like dwelling or belonging as such. Here we find an implicit formulation then of a mode of domesticity that might enable the subject to dwell while adrift, literally to be at home anywhere within a condition of radical territorial insecurity. Thank you. The next uh, paper and topic is uh, Architecture Gone with the Wind. Uh, it's going to be presented by Ruben Alcolea, and it's uh, made with his colleagues at the Universidad de Navarra in Pamplona, Spain. Well, 
Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for the presentation. Well, first of all, I, I would like to, to give the, to thank especially Mark and, uh, uh, for the very kindly and nice presentation of Fargo School of Architecture in Pompano, who, of course, extends his invitation to all the people who is interested in come there and, and show us uh, our, uh, their work. Well, I will try to uh, to put together different um, um, different papers. I mean, uh, this is not a very orthodox paper, as long as there are, we are uh, different people who have been working in several topics. And I will try to put together the whole thing and try to make it more easier to to understand. But, uh, the fact is, um, well, our contribution to this seminar, um, we shall consider architect's journey from three, well, more or less uh, three very d brief different angles to open up the discussion and hitting the relationship between the elements of a journey, the traveler and the explorer. Uh, in the last century, journeys were explained the way to transmit and acquire architectural, sorry, sorry, sorry start again? No. Uh, said in the, the last century, uh, journeys were explained the way to transmit and acquire architectural values. So they made Paul Sherbert's intuition uh, become ever truer that ideas to be effective must be in the air or said differently must be in many minds at the same time. So firstly, we will look at journeys made by those who recount their discoveries. Uh, these are the times quite fanciful and highly developed, making this journey a veritable event both for the traveler and for those who hear his stories. They travel to gain knowledge and discoveries later transformed into teaching some. Sometimes this teaching does not exactly correspond to what they saw or learned but rather to what was created starting from the original experience. Together with this attitude, we will we'll consider those who travel to find architecture that they already know. These are journeys born from the interest provoked by the images of familiar works, which triggered the adventure and led architects to want to see their surroundings and special characteristics firsthand. The learning here is, above all, for the travelers. Secondly, and similar to this um, first kind of journeys, although with different results, are those that end up becoming permanent situations, where the fascination about the newly discovered leads to the decision to settle, in which the traveler implements and conveys his architecture. The discovery of a new place and a new setting will become then the detonators for the architect's work and make him realize that his journey has come to an end. And finally, we will refer to those journeys whose objective is not so much to discover, but rather to spread and communicate specific way of understanding architecture. This is the publicity journey to propagate the ideas. Okay. So one very thought-provoking aspect when talking about architecture journey is the way in which their content has been recorded and later conveyed and, in short, how they have been absorbed by others. Until the present, documents generated by journeys have fundamentally been photographs, sketches, and essays about which we would like to make some comments. The first is to highlight how these documentary sources have lost almost all this testimonial value in the present day. Perhaps we can consider this as a reflection of the loss of importance of journey in themselves. The second refers to the authenticity of these documents, in which there is at times a definite dose of invention, suggestion, and even legend, precisely due to the importance they were ascribed up to a few decades ago as stories of not worthy explorers, where people eagerly awaited their abilities to relate what the rest of us didn't see. Along with this too, the third consideration that must be made is about the journey without traveling, or in other words, a journey without going to the destination, using only paper and through which we find out about the places and buildings that we would like to visit or travel to. The principal document of a classic journey was until quite, quite recently the travel notebook. Obviously, these are very rarely still created today. Uh, interest in them has declined, obviously. But on the one hand, this is because almost no surprise remains due to the proliferation of media that bring everything to everybody. And on the other, uh, now we all travel extensively and we probably don't feel the need to capture the details about what is discovered or to even look at it with a great attention. In summary, journeys have probably lost their poetry and the feeling of adventure they once had. Now, nobody can permit themselves a six months, uh, a year, or even one month journey. Travels are now about curiosity, verification, if you like, but not about learning. 
The second consideration refers to a difference between the reality that is perceived and the reality that can be generated using travel papers, which always provide bidirectional interpretations. Paper and journeys and paper journeys establish two roads, two strategies. On the one hand, paper contains the impressions, on the other, recreates it. So paper is used as a guide and support. On the other, paper represents a journey in itself, far from the physical toils of travel. We could say that paper is the illustration of any impression of a visited architectural work. Paper may be a sketch, a photograph, some unattentious of, or the memory itself. In short, an operative strategy for contemplation. If we ponder the reason for traveling, it will be, have its origins in the yearning of contemplation. To travel is valuable for architects insofar as it means contemplating what is seen. This contemplation is geologically possible, not only at the time of the visit, but also by viewing the paper or the memory generated during the visit. The critical confrontation of architectural work requires contemplation strategies. And of, of these strategies is the taking of data. Certainly, this contemplation has different levels and quests, and therefore, contemplation is possible both during and after the journey. This is why paper is crucially important, since, since it is the support that lays the foundation for this contemplation. We could therefore affirm that the paper generated establishes another journey in itself, so that anyone can travel without physically moving. One of the most descriptive cases would be the case of Louis Can and his celebrated sketches. It is well known that he did not sketch his works in situ, but did so long after his journey using a postcard or photograph recreating and reinterpreting the works he visited. Or we would like, uh, we will quote, sorry, like we say, this of Le Corbusier's famous Journey to the East, written many years later with numerous corrections. In fact, Le Corbusier's journey dates to 1911, and the book was published in 1935. So it is worth considering that the paper generated means beyond its own author, especially when it is widespread. The autonomy of paper and its capacity to construct and project can in itself end up being more important than the journey than through about the document. The second topic that we wanted to launch is the, the wall of architects that is associated with an astounding variety of travel experiences, and particularly with intense experiences and ambitious. So these experiences range from the merely touristic to the drastic existential self-exile of those who depart to a new life. And this ends in architects who, after the journey, end up building their habitats, their own house, in an uncontaminated and attractive setting that matches the radicalness of the decisions. This unique situation represents an on-the-edge experience that pushes the limits. <clears throat> in the end, this type of experience has a much more drastic transcendence than the simple pleasure trip. It was this situation that finally conjured the following three examples representative of a significant phenomenon. Data in with considering uh, intensity of travel experiences in the case of architects. These images depict houses designed in the 70s in Spain by a series of foreign architects who settle in these homes with the conviction and resolution that's of, that of this act entails. Bernard Rudowski, again, we have it again, uh, built his own house in Nerja in 90, 1970, Andre Bloch, Built it in 1964 in Carboneras, and John Hudson, his very famous house in Porto Petro in Mallorca in 1972. But inhabiting the frontier, that is what the leading players in these situations have done. Inhabiting the frontier is moving into the realm of abstraction. However, there is the abstraction of the line that delimits the, and separates. But that is nothing in itself, not possessing thickness or size. This line represents a type of permanent indication which only looks towards the sides of the landscape that it divides. This is the abstraction of the transition between the, the before and the after, this ephemeral present that is the object of recurring evocation in the field of philosophical thought and in the realm of poetry, from the still not but now yes, of an absolute journey. This is the moment when one has already lost what one had, but has still not attained what can end up being conquered of the destination. This is true when a destination does indeed exist, and the journey is not moving towards a kind of celebration of absence, towards a not being that, in its way, will also represent the nature or that we will have to denote as the negative of civilization. 
The situation represents by this series of examples also possesses a twofold merging power, the material with the spiritual, the world of explorers or discoverers with the world of poets. In short, there are two counterpoints of a single experience, active and passive, incisive and reticent, of adventure and concealment, or of advancement and withdrawal. It is a conquering of new horizons and the search for a permanent and safe refuge. It is at this point where changing geographic location and vital, vital landscape led itself to the discovery of unfamiliar frontiers in a new existential consecration, but it related to deep attitudes of purification, decontamination, essentialism, and contemplation. And it points to the most radical mental and psychological parameters and yet unknown earthly horizons, perhaps in a particularly immobile and rigid combination as related to the idea of what which is timeless. At the same time, however, uh, there must be an attempt to sublimate this reciprocal fascination between the traveler and the site of destination. This issue has specific and very special subjective meaning when the traveler is an architect by calling with a deep identification with his trade. The journey's destination thus becomes an object of reduplicative mythologizing rises to permanence and prominence. The third of the aspects is that journeys are not always one way, streets in which architects travel towards or distant or dream reality. It is also possible for those studied places and times to physically move towards the viewers. During this, architecture is often idealized, taken on the category of an ideal or an icon. And these realities become perhaps even more real and truer than what is tangible. It may even take the journey unnecessary in the common sense of the world. Besides the anecdotal value, famous architects' conference acted as authentic immersions into his works, by means of, through an almost exhausting descriptions with dozens or maybe hundreds of images, listeners could almost physically participate in the architect's work, in a kind of virtual trip. By means of his talks, the architect himself transferred his work, making small pieces of it reach the most distant places. Exhibition of their work by architects has been a constant through the history of contemporary architecture. It is through these mythological descriptions that works and buildings travel towards listeners, substituting the viewers traveling towards the work. This could be the mediatization of performance or the well-known theory of the spectra, through which there will be pieces of the work returning at each conference, carrying out the work toward the listeners. This strange theory, <coughs> originally attributed to Balzac and widely disseminated in the middle of the 19th century, upheld that objects, included human beings, were formed by a, from an infinite succession of layers or spectra, like an onion skin, and that the photographic camera removed the outermost layer of all of them to capture the image on the paper. Thus, the photographic image became such an inseparable part of this reality that in the absence of the photographed object, the photograph could truly and physically replace the original. As Rosalind Klaus stated in her theory of displacements, the photographic image was not only considered an effigy, a fetish, or a film that had been detached from the surface of a material object and deposited, deposited in another place. It was that this material object had become intelligible. The first photographer travelers captured and trapped small particles of reality imprisoning them on paper to be able to, to later display them to their guests in their bourgeois salons. Like these photographers, in the new media-based society, architects can find small samples of their works in each of their public appearances, thus converting their conference into authentic architectural biopsies. If our daily deceased could regain life in this latent frozen spectrum by means of photographic paper, or like the Tram Hall or the Egyptian pyramids really existed in valuable photo albums, modern architecture exists as a captive, no less real in its images. If the photographic image assumed the category of a manifest icon during the modern movement, embodying its own autonomy with respect to the represented object, now it is our contemporary global and instantaneous society that lets reality be recreated in each of our homes. It is no longer necessary to have seen the reality in itself, not even through public events at which the author narrates the personal history of his works, 
This filter journey has today become a personal and intimate show, letting viewers participate in these private and almost secret travels via new media. This is the case of the notorious house uh, built in 1988 in Bordeaux for a physically handicapped man. In his film, House Life, and after a worldwide premiere, Rem Colhas brings the house to viewers by means of different interlinked video sequences. House Life explains the building, its structure, and its virtuosity to let the viewer enter into the invisible bubble of the daily intimacy of an architectural icon. As Colhas states, it's not flattering, it's just realistic. There is no flattery of the house, but merely reality. In an interview at the end of the movie, Colhas states his surprise about the working methods of Guadalupe, who is the person in charge of cleaning, cleaning of the house. Above all, after watching her carefully polish and clean steps that are possibly never used for the, by the handicapped. He says, uh, such generic cleaning to such an exceptional building, I am surprised. It seems compl completely insane. You see here two systems colliding, the systems of the platonic conception of cleaning with the platonic, platonic conception of architecture. And this is precisely the main interest of Kolha's house life, to depict an absolutely daily reality, to give life to one of these masterworks of architecture, replete with disorder. He wants to reveal those times that are never shown, where it's, it is possible to see the daily reality, a tangible reality that perhaps surpasses and restricts the established myths. The canonical spaces suffer from this restlessness, just like Jeff Wall, this one, just like Jeff Wall did at the Mies Pavilion in Barcelona, his most radical and evocative transformation. These two are examples where a new way of looking of architecture is presented, undoubtedly expanding their field of representation. Enlarging the field of representation means offering a new and different perspective, both of the house and the pavilion, as we are already familiar with both of them due to their propagation published both in specialized and mass consumption, mass consumption media. Nonetheless, it is strange that in house life, it is Guadalupe, the cleaner and assistant, and other secondary characters, and not the owner, who explain the changes, the transformation, and the most domestic details about the home. This is what expands our field of representation, following and interacting with Guadalupe as an unusual and unpredictable viewpoint about the structure of the building open up. And the fact is that we are all Guadalupe, as we watch the movie, attending a complete dissection of the house, of the realest possible house. Well, the director of House Life explicitly proposed to give life to one of these architectural masterpieces that we can see everywhere without maybe being able to see to see them how they really are in everyday life. And banishing the iconic, the iconic and idolized regard of architecture and demonstrating its vitality, fragility and vulnerability by observing the daily life, habits and testimonies of the people who live there, using and maintaining it. While this is true or aims to be so, while attending a screening of house life, we are presented with a filtered and different perspective of the house, down to its last detail, sublimated a guided tour of the house, a journey not far from what anyone would intend to do in vivo. Finally, and to conclude, the media used for all these kind of journeys, whether they are sketchbooks, text, photographs or movies, attract us precisely because they are works directly from the hands and visions of the architect travelers, who bring us fragments of their own works. They are the tangible part of these filtered outlooks. And we can recognize these other places of their, <clears throat> we can recognize, sorry, these other places in them. We no longer need to travel to because they know they now come to us. From Jules Verne novels to the smallest strips, all journeys are filtered and prepared. And the perception of these places and spaces, both in photographs and in new visual mediums, <coughs> media, are transformed by their own construction, describing a dream reality, as if it were thought. These objects or places are as real as the original because they respond to the ideal. They respond directly to the roots of the modern principles, visual and formal or special, exemplifying better than the original that, that the reality it is that is sought, due to being free from physical limitations, because they are more real, if possible, than reality itself. Thank you very much.
Now I get the odd privilege of introducing our dean, uh, Mark Wigley, and his paper, The Myth of the Local, which you know will make it uh, forever gone. Um, so again, just to repeat the pleasure it is to make a kind of a circuit between Columbia University and the University of Pamplona, between New York and uh, a new University of Navarra, which means between New York and, and Pamplona. But to set up a circuit, uh, to make a journey, in this case, you make a journey to us in, in a kind of reaction to the journey that myself and Beatrice and Kenneth have made to you already. And maybe this is the beginning of the possibility for Galia and Felicity and Spiros to make also the return journey. It's not so simple because a journey never goes from A to B because the whole point of the journey is that the journey to B changes A. So the journey is never from A to B because A is no longer A. So that's the first strange thing about journeys, that the thought of journey uh, changes A, which also means that when you make the journey, the journey has already happened. So actually the moment of going from A to B is always a repetition, is always a, a kind of a rehearsal uh, of something that's already uh, happened. And this strangeness of the journey I think is important when thinking about the structure of the architect's, uh, uh, the structure of the architect's journey. Because in, in architecture you will almost never find a real celebration of foreignness. You will never see a really uh, devoted, passionate uh, defense of the alien. And you will always find a celebration of the local. The local exists as a constant uh, uh, reference point. The local uh, never receives the kind of a sneer or a slur of the provincial. The local is always a source of uh, authenticity. Um, foreignness, on the other hand, is always inauthentic. Even the most global of architects cling to some kind of rhetoric of the local. In fact, the reason the global architects suggest to you that you should invite them to come to your place is that they have a special ability to tune into the local. So the reason you want them is that they can see in the local things that you cannot see. So again, even the most mobile figure uh, takes the strength of their journey from their capacity to tune into local conditions. But this is not so easy either, because the idea of the local uh, requires journey. You cannot have a concept of local without a concept of journey. So actually, even the concept of local requires foreignness. Um, in fact, the word local implies a return from a journey, a return to something called the local, a return to something that was there uh, before the journey. Or to say it in a more simple way, uh, local is always the fantasy of a traveler, only ever the fantasy of a traveler. To imagine yourself to be in a local situation is in fact to imagine yourself as having returned from a, a, a journey. To, as it were, to be simply be local would be to be unaware of the possibility uh, uh, of, of, of journey. We, we may or may not, for example, consider the possibility of a journey to another planet. Um, in as much as we don't think of that, uh, it's not, not right to say that, the, that our local territory is that of the Earth. There was this great moment at the end of a Buckminster Fuller lecture where somebody says to him, Mr. Fuller, um, do you believe in life in outer space? And he says, young man, where do you think you are? I mean, I think that the, the, the uh, ability to, to, to locate yourself, to see yourself in, in the local, uh, is made possible by journey. Which means, by the way, that there's no such thing as a local architect. That's a contradiction in terms. Architects are travelers, uh, have always been travelers. Homer, for example, tells us that Daedalus, the founder of Greek architecture, imported his design ideas from Egypt. So even our sense of Greek as a beginning is, is, is a scene of, uh, of, of importing. The architect is always a tourist, um, not simply because the architect travels from A to B, but because the role of the architect is to make the built environment visible uh, as such. And to make the built environment visible is already to make it strange, to change it. So the very concept of architecture takes one out of the everyday, makes the everyday visible as everyday, and in that sense makes the object travel gives a kind of mobility to the object. So in a way, the gift of the architect is to make objects travel even while apparently staying in one place. In fact, we could say that architecture is architecture only in as much as it exceeds the local. 
producing, as it were, the idea of the local in the moment of leaving the local behind. So the gesture of the architect is to suddenly make the local come into focus by producing a kind of departure, a sense of, uh, of, of departure. Uh, this is the most obvious symptom of that, is that, is that uh, architects see everything, and when they walk through cities, they are always looking up like tourists, because the architect is the person for whom everyday life is foreign, is alien. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, which is why, of course, architects uh, so easily accept the possibility of never being paid of never sleeping, of never talking to human beings and so on, because they have already, by virtue of deciding to be architects, have decided to leave, to leave already. Or to be more precise, the role of the architect is to graft the foreign onto the local, to uh, objects, buildings, architectural objects, are not inserted into the city, are not inserted into sites. Objects are inserted into a kind of hypothetical genetic code. The architect uh, claims that there is a genetic code of the local and inserts into that local something of the outside. This, of course, is classically uh, tied up in the logic of the travel sketch, as I think you've already heard very beautifully. The traveling architect captures some genetic material in a site, sampling uh, the material, recording it in the form of a sketch, analyzing it, then grafting uh, uh, the project onto that genetic material uh, and, and then it's, it is assumed that the object that has received now this foreign graft will broadcast the ideas that the architect has bought. So the capacity for an object to speak, to be articulate, and architecture is articulate, and a, simply an articulate object, an object that talks, the capacity for an object to talk depends on the implanting of something foreign to the gene genetic material. But the real paradox here is that what we as architects claim is that the addition of this foreign genetic material, this grafting of the foreign onto the local, makes the local more like itself than it was before. In other words, the great trick of the architect is to say, I will add something to a situation that makes the situation more like what it was before I added it. Uh, in a certain sense, the role of the architect is then to naturalize the everyday, to naturalize the local, to make it seem, as it were, natural. And I have to tell you, there is nothing more foreign than nature. Nature is that which is maximally uh, uh, foreign to us. So to naturalize an object is to profoundly transform it. And I want to give you one uh, quick uh, example, um, a more or less obvious one. Uh, the Sydney Opera House, um, Sydney is in Australia. Um, you know Australia because you think of Australia quite correctly as a continent that emerges out of the rear end of the Sydney Opera House. Right? So this is, this is not an object uh, in Australia. This is a sort of machine producing Australia. Right? Now that effect, that, that sense that this object that obviously arrived, arrived in such a way that it allows Australia to be Australia, more like itself than it ever was before, is the paradox I want to consider. Obviously, it's an easy example because it's posi positioned on a peninsula in a harbor, so it's actually positioned in a space of immigration or emigration. We could ask ourselves, is this building arriving at Sydney or is it leaving? We could be more precise, the heavy horizontal stone seems to belong to the land and the light curves of the shells above seem to belong to the sky, uh, as if uh, um, a as if this is some kind of land yacht, some kind of piece of land that has been pushed into the harbour uh, uh, through the wind, or in reverse, is on its way, uh, uh, on its way out. Um, this was, of course, uh, uh, the design of, uh, uh, of Utsun, uh, a successful competition entry in 1956. Uh, the winner was announced in 1957. Utsun was at the time 38 years old, which makes him technically a young architect, given that we live in the thought that one cannot do anything as an architect. Even one's first commission would not happen uh, until after the age of 40. So this is a kind of a, a shocking statement uh, of, of the ability of, of, a, of, a, of a Danish architect to, as it were, conquer uh, uh, new lands. The jury... Um, Uh, uh, gave this, uh, gave this uh, uh, scheme the, the, the unanimous prize. Many, many years, a very long drama, but in 1962, Utsun produces his only and most extensive account of the logic behind this, and he does so by publishing 
a, a text in Zodiac called Platforms and Plateaus, which he explains the concept both of the stone plinth and of the sails of the clouds. And he does so precisely by showing us his travel sketches uh, uh, in Mexico, where he locates the various platforms and explains the logic of the platforms. And in so doing, he repeats the classical logic. This is an essay that begins with sketches and his own travel photographs, moves into analytical diagrams of the floating uh, uh, of, of lightweight structures above uh, a platform, like the clouds, as you see above, which head relentlessly towards the actual platform of the Sydney Opera House in model form, the interior of the shells, the intersection of the shell and the platform, and then the actual construction of that plinth that was going on at that time. So from the delicate, lightweight sketch of the platform in Mexico, through a series of examples from India, from China, the Acropolis, Japan, he, he ends with the models of the project, and then actually the, the kind of concrete materiality of the platform. But conspicuously, he's not showing you the, the uh, uh, logic of the shelves. What does he say of this long tradition of the plateau? He says what happens in Mexico, in India, in China, in Japan, and in Greece is that the platform converts the site into, quote, something even stronger than nature, a whole new planet, he says. Uh, and, in, and so what he's suggesting is that the platform allows the site to be even more than it is such that when the lightweight structure is placed on top of that platform in the air, you have this ex extraordinary intersection between the quality of the site and the quality of the lightweight visiting temporary transitional movement uh, uh, in the air. He says in this essay that he's been doing a whole series of plateau projects all based on his journeys. So, so far, so good. So far, he seems to be speaking the kind of hardcore religious language of the architect as a traveler who can tune into local conditions, maximize the local conditions by inserting something foreign that lets the local be more than what it was, so that then that acts as a platform for a lightweight uh, 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 structure. The year before, he had published in 1961 an essay on his Stockholm University competition in which he describes the development of his plateau projects and he says, these projects have been achieved through hard and difficult work, as well as through the experiences of my, of my journeys, some of which were to Mexico, India, and China. I mean, this is a very interesting essay. The reason he writes this essay is that somebody who had worked for him had, in fact, won the competition. And his reason for writing the essay is to complain about the fact that the winning entry stole the ideas from him. The winner, the young protege of his office who won the competition, said, you're right. I did steal the ideas from you, but you stole the idea in the first place from Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, Oscar Niemeyer, and Alvar Alto, so it doesn't really matter. We're all in this uh, together. An interesting move, I think, on the part of the young architect. But what's so powerfully interesting about this whole story is, in fact, uh, um, uh, Utzon had not been to those places that he was describing. He had been to Mexico in 1949, but he had not visited Asia, India, Japan, and so on. So in other words, he's pre presenting an explanation for his ongoing series of projects on the plateau, which will culminate in the Sydney Opera House, using examples, in fact, which he had not uh, uh, been to or not seen. Uh, in fact, he'd never been to the site in Australia at all. So again, the, the, the sense of miracle deepens. Here is the site. Um, he hadn't visited the site uh, before winning the competition. Photographs of the site like this one appeared in the 25-page competition uh, brief. And in fact, the, the uh, commissioning uh, architects had selected that site from these nine different sites uh, in Sydney and decided that the peninsula was the uh, uh, correct site because they said, quote, such a harbour setting would be at the same time characteristic of Sydney and provide a landmark for travellers as memorable as the Stockholm Town Hall or the Doge's Palace in Venice. This is an extraordinarily complicated argument. It would be characteristic of Sydney, number one, but it would provide a landmark for travellers, so it's to be seen from people who do not, do not belong to Sydney, and what they would experience would be the memory of the Stockholm Town Hall and the Doge's Palace in Venice, and of course in this case Stockholm, when you're speaking about a Scandinavian architect. So a very complicated identification by which, the, by which this project would simultaneously belong to Sydney and belong to masterpieces of the world on, on the site. So a very complicated play uh, of the local and global. 
Of course, um, uh, Utzon uh, needed to get some information on the site, so he visited the local um, uh, Australian embassy in Copenhagen and watched a publicity film about Australia, and in that film saw some clouds in the Sydney Harbour, and claims to, in, upon seeing those clouds, have decided that basically what he had to bring to Sydney was what was already there, the clouds. Um, but it's worse than that. He treated the site as a variation uh, of local conditions. He thought that the site in Australia was very similar to a peninsula uh, that projects into the strait separating Denmark and Sweden. So actually a, a, a site between sites. But it's more than that. He identifies the site with his hometown. He says, I had no difficulty at all uh, uh, visualizing uh, Benelong Point in, in, in Sydney because we have the castle of Helsinger on the point just like your tram depot at Fort uh, uh, Macquarie. So this is the site as was presented to the architects and this is one of the images of the tram depot on that peninsula. So when looking at this, he recognized his hometown. So he has, as it were, the hometown advantage in Sydney on a site that he'd never been to but he was able to, as he say, on the basis of these photographs, start to dream. So he started to dream that Sydney was his hometown, so he designed for his home uh, a, a project in this uh, location. He sent his entry into the competition along from entries from all around the world. There were 233 submissions from more than 45 countries against the wishes of Australian architects who insisted that there should be no foreign architects uh, entering the competition unsuccessfully. Uh, the problem for them was that the premier, the, the boss of Australia, was himself a first generation immigrant, so he couldn't understand the argument. Uh, he, he saw Australia as an immigrant country, so and precisely uh, a, a foreigner would be an Australian by virtue of doing a project uh, uh, in, in the country. Uh, of course, he sends his entry in, uh, here they are, the entries arriving, uh, and here are the, the local members of the jury, the government architect and the head of the local architecture school. Um, some drums like this one, some architects send in thousands of drawings uh, on the assumption that that would help them to win. Uh, this is the drawing of the, uh, of the entry of uh, Utsun, which gives on the right a very clear explanation, including the thought that the stone podium will belong to the land and the, sh the shells will belong to the clouds. This is the, the plan of the plinth and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and a kind of a section of, of, the, uh, of the shells. This is the jury. Um, so, of course, it's, it's uh, 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 Leslie Martin and Eero Saarinen were the foreign, two foreign uh, architects, and the two local architects are Ashford on the right and Parks on the left. Um, and here they are admiring the Utsun uh, sketch. It's important to note that Saarinen arrived five days late uh, for the jury because he and his wife Elaine were in, having a holiday in Fiji um, and the, nevertheless they arrived and carried out the jury and of course Saarinen uh, plays a big role in identifying uh, Utsun as the, as the uh, winner and Saarinen then after, after the announcement of the winner went back to the United States via Indonesia, India, Rome, and London, just to give you a sort of a general feeling that he was basically himself in a high tourist mode uh, while judging this competition. Reporters called uh, Utsun, who was completely surprised that he won, and he said that uh, he didn't, never thought he would win, but these photographs of the site in Australia made him dream of home, so he did this project. So basically these are fantasies about uh, Scandinavia. So he was basically fantasizing about his domestic life uh, and accidentally, as it were, wins the competition. Um, he then, for the first time, travels to Australia, bringing with him, this is the announcement, and the image, by the way, on the top, he didn't do a perspective of his project, so an Australian artist was called in to do the perspective. So even the first image that appears of his project is not his project, it's not by him. And already, if you read in there, there's already kind of a controversy. Basically, the controversy was the project was seen to be too, too interesting by an architect that was too young. Here, he finally arrives. Um, and much, much commentary on his suits. He was uh, often described as a kind of movie star figure, and he, he clearly charmed everybody, but he had in a box the model of the project. So finally people were going to discover what it is, uh, and they set it up in the town hall, and this is the original uh, uh, model from, I think, July of 57, uh, and there he is actually sort of, uh, I don't know what he's doing, breathing life into it or... or uh, <laughs> absorbing all of the, all the kind of positive ions coming from, from, his, uh, 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 from his brilliance. 
And, and the model was, was on the inside of the shells in, in very shiny gold, which then reflected the, the water outside. So there was seen to be a confusion. I mean, the argument perhaps of the project is that the, is that the podium belongs to the land and the shells belong to the air and the people belong to the water. So they become, the people are as it were pulled in and pulled out of the project. And you will, if you know the design for the, for the Opera House, it's very ambiguous as to whether one is leaving Australia to climb onto this thing or the other way uh, around. Um, he then, on the way back from Australia, visits Japan for the first time. So this experience of visiting Japan and seeing the podiums comes after he's already presented the podium concept as the major concept. He's, he writes a letter back to, to Ashford on October 57 and says, on the way back, on the travel back, I have studied a lot in relationship to the Opera House and I've had my ideas confirmed as to the shells and the detailing of the glass walls and so on. So the experience of going to Japan is to confirm the idea that he has always launched. In other words, again, the thought that the journey is always a rehearsal or a repetition of something that's already in place. Uh, on March of 58, he returns to Australia with the so-called Red Book, which is based around this kind of Mendelssohn uh, uh, sort of expressionist uh, sketch and a series of drawings of the project and with, on the basis of those drawings signs the contract. Um, they, this uh, red book includes photographs of the first model which was done after the competitions but the shells were already changing. They were already not working out but nor was the podium. So basically it was a project that had a podium and shells. The podium didn't work out and the shells didn't work out. So what began was five years of torment as they tried to make the podium work because the, the problem it turned out to be is the peninsula was not really a peninsula, it was very shaky. So the podium is actually stronger than the land on which it stands. So in a sort of technical sense, you can almost see that Australia is actually hanging underneath uh, uh, the podium. So the engineers were forced to make the podium into a kind of a bridge and an extraordinarily beautiful design uh, of Ove Arab following the instincts of uh, Utsun is, is used to set up the podium. The problem was the podium should then be supporting the shells, but the shells don't work. So they didn't really know in which way the podium should take its form. So of course, in a very canny way, uh, uh, Utsun was very ambiguous as to the nature of the shells while they were trying to figure it out. Finally, in uh, April of 58, they figured out what the podium should be uh, while still not knowing what the shells above uh, uh, were going to do. In November of 58, he goes back to Sydney and on the way back from Sydney, he visits China and again writes back to the client and says, everything I've experienced in China confirms that what we're doing is okay. In other words, there's nothing discovered in those places which leads to a change in the, uh, uh, in the concept. Uh, he says that there is in China innumerable beautiful staircases and floating roofs. So again, he's basically uh, approving of China for being as interesting as, as himself. In 1959, he starts doing, for the first time, the cloud drawings that will become quite famous and publishes them in Zodiac Number no. 5. And Zodiac acted as the kind of therapeutic journal by which he would every few years report on the progress of the uh, project. And in 1959, those drawings appear alongside images of the first model. So what's being celebrated in Zodiac is actually a model that's been superseded and there's this constant maneuver by which what's presented is as a definitive project is in fact a project in uh, uh, crisis and it's exactly in that moment that the construction of the podium uh, 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 begins. At a certain point uh, in September of 61 somewhat famously he uh, basically five years of failure from a structural point of view is overcome by the insight that the geometry of the, of the Opera House can be organized based on a perfect uh, uh, sphere uh, and very, very quickly he then returns to, to Sydney with the so-called yellow book in which the new geometry of the, uh, of the house is there including now the poetry devoted to the shells themselves and this is him arriving with the yellow book and again the, 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 you can really map the smiles and the photographs from 61 on in which every image you see is of the triumphant celebration of the kind of breakthrough for all of his good charm and, by the way, very excellent ties that he was wearing during that time, uh, which were much commented on and, and uh, uh, analyzed, there was, of course, a huge amount of uh, stress. And this was seen to be the sort of therapeutic breakthrough. So you see, for example, when they make this model, it's just a sort of, uh, it's equivalent to drinking. Uh, and this sort of calm movie star look of, you know, um, this is just so good um, that I, it's just hard, it's not even worth my while to discuss with you. 
the obvious brilliance of this thing. You know, what can I say? Some people have it and some people don't. Uh, he then returns to Australia and presents that concept in a series of television programs in which the whole thing is made to seem as simple as simple can be. Again, one of the important things of the architect, the magic trick, the hands of the architect producing the miraculous uh, uh, innovation. And again, uh, um, even the sort of um, casual wear of the new relationship to the model, the, the liberation of the geometry allows for a much more relaxed uh, um, uh, evolution uh, and just this sort of, now you see, just this sort of a calm confidence. Everything becomes a photo opportunity as he stands in front of the drawings of this new uh, uh, geometry. It's in the spring of uh, 62 that he makes these t television programs, and it's in that moment that Zodiac publishes, he publishes in Zodiac that key article on the platforms and so on. So in other words, the uh, article about the platforms comes at the moment in which finally the spherical geometry has solved the problem, and he presents his journeys through uh, China, Japan, India, and so on, journeys which, in fact, he had not made uh, up till that point. So those were journeys that, as it were, he did in order that he could, in, in the spring of, uh, uh, of 62, present the platform concept as the natural outcome of his research work as the traveling uh, uh, documenter. Uh, not by chance is the sort of frontispiece of that article showing him in a car, uh, obviously explaining to wh whoever's in the car the nature of this journey. So they're basically in a kind of, in, at first, incongruous association between his travel log, there is this image of him as, as a traveler. So what I'm trying to say to you here very quickly is, there's a very, very strange circuit between the idea of travel, the idea of home, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, already in 1947, uh, Utzon, before leaving Scandinavia, uh, had done uh, a, a manifesto with images of India, the Near East, and China. In other words, he had rehearsed this trip uh, uh, already in manifesto form, very much affected by his, teacher, his teacher's visit to China uh, 20 years earlier and the 1935 book of travel sketches of Rasmus and his teacher. So in other words, the, 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 the possibility uh, of travel to China and the kinds of lessons one would learn if one would do that were, were being rehearsed by him again and again and again. So actual travel here is just a confirmation of fantasy or a kind of stamping of, a, of an architect's passport in, in order to make and to legitimize this circuit. And we could be more precise. There's a kind of a circuit between local travel and long distance travel. And I think this is a subject that one could think about. In fact, the very decision of Utzon to become an architect comes out of travel. He was himself the son of a naval architect who had been educated in England. And his parents visited the Stockholm exhibition in 1930 and were completely transformed by it and came back and changed the house, changed their clothes, changed their food, changed their habits. And it's in this moment that uh, um, Utzon uh, uh, become, uh, realizes that he could become an architect and, and starts to study an architectural school in 1937. Uh, in 1942, he left occupied Denmark to go to Sweden for the rest of the war, repeating exactly that journey that his parents had made uh, in the same way, and in fact goes there and meets Alto, who was, of course, one of the young figures circling around uh, uh, and writing about the, the exhibition in Stockholm of 1930. 1948, uh, he traveled to Morocco with a stay in Paris. The interesting part of that journey for him was not the visiting of Le Corbusier, Leger, and others, but the, uh, uh, Morocco. 1949, he got a scholarship to the United States, and he used that as an excuse to get to Mexico. So that's the moment of going to Mexico that, as it were, sets in motion. And that's the only trip that he makes before the Sydney Opera House scheme that could be used as part of his narrative. So just quickly to finish, uh, during the time in which the logic of the shells is completely unclear, uh, the platform itself is on the move, uh, uh, and it's taking a long time, and it's absolutely massive. And so there is within Australia an extraordinarily complicated psychological reaction because nobody had understood how huge and how infrastructural this podium would be, this thing that belongs to what is already there. And slowly the object starts to rise out of that uh, uh, podium. But what had gone on from 57 through to 62, 63 is this famous evolution in the logic of the shells. You could argue that this kind of movement of the geometry, while it was experienced by Ove Arab and Utzon as, as a considerably stressful, 
you could argue that this is a kind of fluttering in the wind, that this, this kind of potential for the shells to take all of these different forms is in fact at the heart of the very shell concept uh, in the beginning. And of course the obvious relief they find at the end in coming up with a, with a more integrated structural concept that both is both honest or rigorous to Utzon's original view and basically would not fall over, which is the problem all the way along, uh, uh, this kind of evolution in a way would be from, from a philosophical point of view would, would, would support Utzon's claim that the platform allows for, for lightness. Uh, so the, 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 the kind of complexity of the problem in fact I think reveals a kind of a lightness. Um, so in a certain sense, the, the platform did act as an incubator for different kinds of shell processes. And after the final uh, design was worked out, it's only then at that moment that Utzon emigrates to Australia. So that he actually, in March of 63, arrives in Sydney more or less at the moment that the platform is being finished. So almost he arrives exactly as his project would suggest in the gap between the platform and the shells, exactly the place where people are in the model of this building, usually in a multitude. He himself arrives uh, 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 in that moment uh, and assumes his uh, uh, sort of How Howard Rourke relationship to this massive uh, uh, object. Uh, and of course, famously in 1965, for yet another zodiac issue. He expresses the enormous confidence he feels in that moment by, by structuring this multi-exposure photograph to reflect the organization of the wings, the internal wings of the shells that will hold the glass and of course basing that on the image of a seagull in flight that he finds in a book not about Australia but a book about Antarctica and publishes an, images, an image of the rippling waters of Antarctica to explain his project in uh, 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 Sydney. So if it was not that ancient Greece, uh, uh, Japan, Mexico, uh, China, etc., etc., are needed in order to localize this building, finally Antarctica is called in. Uh, uh, and of course, if you, if you know anything about Australia and New Zealand, you'll know Antarctica is a really big deal. But the water of Antarctica is not the water of the Sydney Harbour. So in other words, the water of the Sydney Harbour is made more Sydney-like by importing a piece of cold uh, Antarctic wind. Uh, of course, everything is is headed for disaster. This is this is uh, Utzon no longer smiling. Uh, uh, one of his best ties is still in operation, but but um, this is him leaving the the office of the premier, having a few weeks before handing in his resignation, which starts off a whole series of protests, as you know. And eventually, the building is 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 launched and open, uh, quite quite different uh, in many many of its crucial aspects to those insisted on, on by Utzon. So just to finish, um, basically what happened is that, is, that, uh, not, uh, is that when he leaves Australia, he doesn't go back to Scandinavia, he goes to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii heads to, back to Mexico, revisits the site of his, and then goes to the United States, and from the United States sends a postcard of a picture of a Mayan temple from Mexico to his Australian assistant uh, saying, went to Yucatan, the ruins are wonderful, so why worry? Sydney Opera House becomes a ruin one day, like no, no problem. And then he wrote another letter to Siegfried Gideon saying that, you know, he would just use the ideas that he developed in Sydney and other projects. In other words, the return journey would be uh, 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 operating. Of course, as you probably know, Utzon retreats and was something of a manic depressive by character, by the way, uh, and retreated to the island of Mallorca in Spain, returning us again, this circuit, back to Spain. But it's, it goes deeper than that because, of course, the crucial breakthrough in developing the spherical geometry uh, in 1962 was made possible by the arrival in the office of Utzon of a very young Rafael Moneo who had graduated who was in, uh, from Navarra, precisely, who had graduated in Madrid the, the year before and arrived and for two years worked on the geometry of the shells and his expertise in descriptive geometry is often cited as the reason that Utzon was being able to make uh, 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 his, his breakthrough. After, uh, after working with Utzon, uh, Moneo then went back to Madrid, but before doing so, traveled around the Scandinavian countries and in a local form resurrected exactly the same journey that Utzon himself had made, and in fact went to meet Alto in, in a kind of symbolic 
uh, repetition of the contact with Alto in Scandinavia uh, uh, and so on. And perhaps not by accident, this architect, Moneo, uh, recently has completed a building here back in New York, uh, the man from Navarra completing uh, a project here at Columbia University, but not just any project, the last gap in the, the original McKim design, in other words, the most local specific problem, uh, inserting himself on top of the not very elegant project of James Sterling, and therefore one foreigner on top of another foreigner trying to, as it were, complete the local situation, and making, I think, a very persuasive argument that the only way to honor the stonework of McKim is to work in aluminum, a material that uh, Moneo himself had never uh, used. And perhaps it's no accident that the summer house of Rafael Moneo is in New York, or exactly the same place that uh, Utsun retreated to. So just a kind of clumsy example to demonstrate to you that the architect's journey is a profoundly weird thing. We do a 10-minute break and then continue. <laughs> 